my clarity would open fairly. Seven to love. The 
room was so quiet that you could hear the pin drop. The things we overlook are simple and ordinary that we take for granted. Truly wonderful. You know, we might that the most precious things in life cannot be bought or built by man. The seven wonders of the world. I'd like to ask you, I add one more person to that list. No, make, make it number one plus plus plus. Firstly, we'd like to add that it's a wonder of the world that God knows in us. Can you add that to your list too? A wonder of the world that God loves in me.
churches and uh, they preach to us about an hour and a half and then we go out down to town of Columbus in the city and uh, pass out tracts and street preach and uh, hold signs, uh, do a little bit of everything uh, to try to win them people to the Lord. And, uh, most of the time we was, I was down by uh, the courthouse area this week and uh, people seem very receptive to taking the tracks and, and very interested by hearing about the Lord. So it's a, a good good trip, and uh, it's good to see, always good to see the Lord still working in people's lives. Cause, uh, people up there ain't like they are around here. I mean, uh, they will gladly look at you and say, no, I don't want that. You know, they're, they're not friendly people by nature, I guess. Sorry, Dave. But, uh, <laughs> Danny broke from all, I guess we need to promote high because uh, people up there, you know, they're not the southern style people. They're not uh, hospitality. Uh, so, you know, they, they're not going to come up to you and go, oh, you know, it's glad to see you. Uh, it's more like, hey, I wish you wasn't here. So, uh, <laughs> it's always a good time. Then we, uh, at the end of the week, I'll go to the Ohio State ball game, uh, pass out tracks, same thing, old signs. And uh, this last game, I think there's over 100 some thousand people there. So, uh, whether people took the tracks or not, they still seen signs and some of the people was preaching. So, you know, these people, a lot of people got God's word. Uh, what they do with it will be up to them. But uh, hopefully, the Holy Spirit will work on as well. But it's a good time. Uh, enjoy the trip up there and had a good, safe trip to the same for the Lord. And, uh, give us give me protection while I was up there. And, uh, so, but I uh, just want to say again, they appreciate everything we send up there to them, and they, they always use it. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you all hear this coming out? Okay. I'm going to have Craig help me out. Uh, we've got our new books. I assume these are good to hang out. Um, do I'll hit one side and we'll hit the other. You mind raising your hand if you want to look for starting a new new series? So I'll probably begin at the end. Craig giving us a little information, testimony about what he experienced this week. I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to work out because this morning I was getting in my lesson trying to trying to kind of clean some things up on the lesson and there was a whole part I wanted to do at the beginning and it's just like, Lord's like, just move it to the end. You know, you may need it until next Sunday. So I guess that was the reason why I knew. And then I walked in and they said something about asking Craig to come up here and talk. So, all right, so you can probably tell by... Is that too loud? It seems a little, no, it's a little loud, but okay. I can hear you. Good. <laughs> um, so you can tell it's uh, what we're going to be in over the next 13 weeks or so is the, the books of Ezra and Esther, which um, honestly for me, I don't have a whole lot of, you know, from the start, a lot of experience. I've read through the books, but never really done a deep dive into them. So this is it's going to be a great opportunity for me. Uh, and hopefully it is for you as well. So. Um, before we get started, and before we get into the book of Ezra, um, I'll, uh, I'll lead us in prayer to start this lesson off. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for allowing us to come out to your house. Thank you for everyone that came out this morning. Uh, I ask that uh, you give me the words I need to say, and hopefully that, Lord, that we will uh, take what you want us to take from this, from the, your word. And uh, Lord, I ask you to bless the remainder of this service. Bless Pastor Walt. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so I'll start. Thinking about this lesson this morning, I thought this is a little bit strange. I kind of felt like, you know, I was like a historic first um, because I get to not only go after Pastor Wall, but before Pastor Wall. But kind of <laughs> stuck in the middle there. I'm like, wow, that's, I don't know if that's ever happened before at this church. So it's only in the middle. So anyway, I'm just, uh, just thinking about that. But, um, so we're going to be, we're actually going to be our memory verse 
So go ahead and uh, go to Ezra, chapter number one. That's where we'll be for a little bit. Um, but our memory verse is actually in 2 Peter. So go to Ezra first. I'll give you a chance to, to go to that. And then you'll be in 2 Peter as well. So, And then we'll go to a couple of different places. Because there's a little bit of a background we've got to get with Ezra. So while you're turning, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ezra. Um, in case you weren't aware, Ezra uh, has a lot of different titles. But he can be considered a teacher a priest, uh, and a scribe. So who do you think wrote the book of Ezra? Anybody got a guess? Timothy, I know you have it. Ezra. Well, (laughs) most people think Ezra. Of course, there's always those people out there who say, well, maybe it was this person, maybe it was Nehemiah, maybe it was this person. But um, when when you look at Ezra and uh, 1 and 2 Chronicles, there's a lot of similarities there. So a lot of people think that Ezra wrote those three books. At least, and, and I'll show you a couple things as to why that may be. Um, but we do know it's one of the, the later books, as far as when we look at the history of Israel, it's one of the later books in their um, kind of their journey, starting in Egypt, you know, in Abraham, and all the way through. This is kind of one of the later por- uh, portions of it. I'm going to give you a little bit of a review because it's been, I'd say we probably spent about maybe three years or more on, I can remember Dave talking about judges years ago. <coughs> And that's kind of from the start, and we've made it all the way through, and Saul and David and the, the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom, and now we're up to the point where we're to Ezra. And so this is kind of uh, an inter- interesting topic. So just some of the things you're going to see here, we're going to see two journeys um, back into Jerusalem. So before I go into some of this stuff, uh, let's just talk a little bit about, actually let's go to our memory verse before I get too far ahead of myself. So 2 Peter 1.4, 2 Peter 1.4. And we'll, we'll explain how this all ties together towards the end. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4, do you mind staying with me, please? All right, uh, verse number four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. All right, you may be seated. All right, so we're talking about exceeding great and precious promises. And I want you to think about that, about promises throughout this lesson today. And really, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Yeah, I'm in full teacher mode right now, so you're getting some homework at the end uh, to be thinking about some promises. But and if you look at the plight of the, of the children of Israel all the way from in Egypt and what they went through in Egypt, and then they... You know, they were led to the freedom as they, you know, under Moses, and um, then they entered the promised land, and, and then they were united under one kingdom, un, under one kingdom, all the, the 12 tribes under Saul, and then, you know, Saul just didn't cut it, and, and then David's reign, and you should talk about David and Solomon and how they had kind of risen, and the, the, you know, it, it was at its peak. Um, and just to give you a little bit of historic context, this is uh, around 965 B.C., so that's before Christ. So we're looking at nearly a thousand years before Christ reigns. So that's where Solomon, Solomon's in his, in his glory. And of course Solomon falls into sin, like all of us do. And things happen. And the kingdom splits. And that's when it kind of goes downhill from there. And over the next two or three hundred years, both kingdoms, you have the northern one and the southern one, they both really start to fall away. Uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, you know, has its good and bad moments. The northern kingdom is just, you know, it's just Pretty much bad from the start. Uh, and then they both get taken into captivity. Uh, one gets taken by the Assyrians and one by the Babylonians. So that's where we're at now. Um, we're about 600 or so B.C. So still 600 years before Christ. That's a long time. 600 years is a long time. Um, so they take, the, take them away. And this is where we, this is where we kind of pick up um, with what we're talking about right here is the fact that, all right, they're in captivity now. And are they going to be in captivity forever? What's the word of the Lord say? No. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. So let's look at a couple of things before we get going. All right. So God makes a lot of promises. Um, promises to us. Promises in, in history, in, this, in the book, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. There's a lot of promises he makes. And he makes some promises to the children of Israel early on. So if you wouldn't mind to go to the book of Joshua, let's look at some promises he makes. Before we get into this Captivity and freedom. Let's look at some of these uh, promises. So Joshua chapter number 24. And we're going to be in verse number. Well, there's all kinds of 
verses we could we could read, but I'm going to read in uh, starting with verse number 19. So chapter 24, verse number 19. This is a very famous passage here um, in Joshua. But you know that you know how the children of Israel were from the start. It was a constant cycle of you know, falling away and then coming back, coming back to the Lord, and then you know falling back into sin. Worshiping false gods, and then back to the holy God, and it's just a constant battle for them, and, um, which we can, you know, we can definitely uh, see where they're coming from. It is not, um, it's not always easy with the, the way, you know, our sin nature. So let's look at verse number nineteen. So this is Joshua, and Joshua said unto the people, "You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God; He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins." So he's talking about all the things that they're doing, who they're worshiping, and they're worshiping their, their gods from the other side of the flood. And it says, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done to you. And the people said unto Joshua, nay, but we will serve the Lord. So jo Joshua is telling here what the Lord has said. The Lord's saying, you can't continue to do this and I'm going to let you do it. Okay? This is, this is a promise right here. Like, it's going to happen. He says, let's go back and it says, he will turn. Do you hurt and consume you? Okay? So if the Lord says it, is it going to come true? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. So, what happens? All right, let's fast forward a little bit. Several hundred years. Let's go into the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. This is right before Ezra. So to help myself out, I have to put a little timeline in here as the thing. So let's see, how many years was that? That's roughly... I mean, we're looking at six or seven hundred years have passed. There's been a lot of a lot of good things have happened with the children of Israel, and a lot of a lot of really bad things have happened. Um, so we're in Second Chronicles chapter number thirty-six. This one, I saved myself a little bit of embarrassment. I was kind of reading through this morning, and I looked at one of my verses, and I thought, "That's nothing." I, I remember not saying it's nothing. It's not what I wanted. So I could have really gotten myself into a fit this morning. But uh, we're in chapter 36 and verses, start with verse number 15. Go up to four, verse number 14. So we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse number 14. So again, we're talking about promises here. And so I'll go back to verse 14. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So there you go. There's some stuff right there. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. So even after all they had done, the Lord still had compassion. Uh, he still was giving them a mouth here, still giving them a, a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth chance. And it says, verse number 16 is the key thing, that they mocked the messengers of God and despised the words and misused his prophets. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. So remember what he said in Joshua, what he would do? This is, this is what's come to pass right here. Uh, the Lord said it, and the Lord followed through with it. Um, and the key word, I think, if you look at verse number 17, so they mocked him, they despised him, they misused him. Verse number 17 starts with the word, therefore. Anybody know what that therefore is? Not many people use therefore in conversation, but typically it's like because of. So it's like because you said that, therefore, this is what's going to happen. And look what he did. He brought upon them the king and the Chaldees and slew the young men as you continue to go down. So this is the point where God had had enough. This is his point where he's sending a message. And, you know, this happens to us. We've talked to them. Pastor Wallace talked about this. And, um, in, in the Word of God, it talks about this that you know God will get our attention one way or the other, and this was His this was His way. He had tried many different ways to get their their attention, but this was His way. So they get carried off into captivity over the course of hundreds of years, and that's really what brings us into the Book of Ezra. Um, so we think about Ezra, you know, the stories of Daniel and all that kind of stuff. This is kind of in the same period around that around that era. Um, You've heard of King Nebuchadnezzar and um, Babylon and how they came through, and they weren't a. This was not a very nice king. This was not a good a good people to be taken over by, and so that's what happens. So they're taken off into captivity, and that's the end of the story, right? 
No, absolutely not. We know that's not the end of the story. You know, it could have been, but the Lord chose for it not to be the end of the story. So let's look at a couple of different things also. So God made the promise, and then let's go to the book, and if you don't want to follow along, we don't have a whole lot of time, but let me just read to you a couple of things. Jeremiah chapter number 25, I'll just read you a couple of things here, because for time's sake, let's see what verse I want to hit on. But anyway, in chapter 25, verses 1 through 11, Jeremiah prophesied through the Lord that they would be in captivity. So Jeremiah had told them, this was before they were taken away. He said, therefore, this is verse number 8, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So Jeremiah was proclaiming it. So this is not something that just happened. These things happened for a reason. And uh, there's also, so Jeremiah proclaimed that, that they were going to be taken away. They were going to be punished. They were going to be chastened for what they were doing. But he also, if, you want to, if you're following along with me, if you go to, ahead to verse uh, chapter number 32, he also prophesied on the other side of it. And we're in verse number 37. It said, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So God had a plan. It wasn't just to punish them and get rid of them, and they're my chosen people, no more out of here. No, he had a plan. And it continues on. And, and so Jeremiah, many years before this, prophesied that this was going to happen. And, you know, this is one thing that just it kind of... And I guess it strengthens my faith and just kind of gets me excited for the Word of God is when you look at these kind of things and you're like, this stuff was prophesied hundreds of years before, yeah. and it came true. And you just keep flipping and you see that, like, oh, they predicted it. It happened. They predicted it. It happened. And then, of course, the New Testament was, I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of references that were from the Old Testament that happened. So if this doesn't you know, strengthen me, I don't know what's going to because this is just, it's kind of cool to see it happen. Um, people out there, of course, are going to try to shoot it down, but there's a... Uh, there's a lot of amazing prophecies that came true. And so, so what happens now? So let's go back to the Ezra. And I won't have you flipping to me any more places anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll let you rest your fingers for a little bit. So we're back to Ezra. So I'm just trying to sum up kind of how things were going. So the children of Israel, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom are both in captivity now. Israel has been destroyed by the Babylonians. The temples destroyed knocked down, all those things that they built in Solomon's day, gone. They took the gold out of there. It's just in ruins. Uh, I can imagine how sad that would have been for the people, especially for that remnant that was still loyal and still faithful to the Lord. So now we're in, in the book of Ezra. And uh, it's kind of interesting how this thing started. If you, you know, if you get a chance, if you look at the very last two verses of Second Chronicles and the first two verses of Ezra, they're nearly identical. Okay, so we know there's some connection between these two. Um, but they're nearly exactly the same. So let's look at, at verse number one because there's a lot here. We could almost probably spend all morning on just verse number one because there's so many things uh, to talk about. So verse number one of Ezra, chapter number one. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also to writing, saying, We'll get back to what the proclamation said. But if you look at all this stuff, so we talk about Cyrus, king of Persia. And history, the history teacher in me, I just had, had to look up. Let's do a little deep dive on, on Cyrus. Um, Cyrus, the kingdom, they conquered most of the known world at the time uh, throughout Asia. Um, and Cyrus was actually, not spiritually, but he was actually a good king as far as a lot to his people. Um, a lot of people, a lot of later kings looked up to Cyrus. He has a lot of different names. I mean, I even looked at, it was one of Thomas Jefferson's, um, I guess, role models was King Cyrus. Now, uh, we know Jefferson was somewhat religious, but he looked up to Cyrus. There's a lot of other people in society that have looked up to King Cyrus for a lot of the things he did secularly with the government and with the way he treated people. And, um, so there's a lot of, he's got all kinds of nicknames. I looked up his nicknames. Uh, I found it online. And, uh, there's... There's like 13 of them. And a lot of them are kings. He took over places. One of them was great king and mighty king and king of Babylon, king of the four corners of the world. So he had all kinds of names that he was given. Uh, even in, in Iran today, many people revered King Cyrus 
as like, you know, like it's like they're George Washington. You know, that's who they look to. This is what we're talking about when we talk about Persia, Iran. So there's a, so he's got a certain um, amount of clout amongst him amongst in just in history. But what he did for the children of Israel uh, was even greater than that. So we look at it, it says, So now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might be, uh, by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be fulfilled. Remember we, we read about Jeremiah, some of the things he said. Uh, here's a couple of verses. Uh, I'll just read them. I've got them down here. It's in Jeremiah 25, and it said, It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and their land of Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolation. So this is when Cyrus comes in and takes out the Babylonians. Okay. Um, Isaiah 44, which, which is just amazing to me, over 100 years before, it, uh, Isaiah said, that, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all of my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So Cyrus is named by name in the book of Isaiah as someone who's going to do something for Jerusalem. So this was these are the words spoken, and you can say, okay, it's just coincidence. No, no, those aren't those aren't coincidence. We know that. Um, and then it says the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. That's the middle part of it. And that's another thing that you could really look into. You know, Cyrus is not um, a believer. If you look into what Cyrus, you know, Cyrus's life, he kind of he kind of played to a lot of different religion, religions. And but he's, how does, does the Lord stir up unbelievers for a purpose? Yes. yes, absolutely, he does. And I've had these discussions with people before, and you know, you probably should steer away to it from a lot of political discussions. But I've had discussions with people. That, you know, say like, no, that person, that president was not of God. Well, yeah, I think they were, were. no matter whether they're a godly person, sure. but the Lord put them there for a reason. Uh, Proverbs 21, 1 said, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will go, or he, he will. So, so he stirred up Cyrus. Uh, for some reason, he stirred Cyrus up that he made this proclamation. So let's look at what this proclamation exactly was. Uh, let's see if I want to say anything else about that. All right, here's the proclamation. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. All right, so he's kind of, he's given, he's given some um, respect and some glory to God for giving him everything. Who is there among you? So this is what he says. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel which is in Jerusalem. So he says, let's go go back to Jerusalem and build a house of the Lord. So, and whosoever, verse number four, remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the man of, of this place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So he's allowing the people of the Jews to go back. He's giving them the opportunity. He doesn't force them to go back, but he's allowing them to go back, as mentioned in prophecy from hundreds of years before. Which is just an amazing thought to think about. So, what really made me think about this also? Remember how how evil a lot of the people had turned in the days before they were captured. Just, think, just remember some of the things that they were doing and how they were just destroying the temple and they were doing some just awful things within the temple. That there's still people left because there's a lot of people that went. Uh, if you skip on ahead to the very end, they have to tell you how many people went. Forty-two thousand three hundred and sixty. So there were that many people remaining that were, I almost feel like they were waiting. They were ready for it. They were waiting for their opportunity to go back. Um, so as we read along, we'll see that, um, so there was a chief person that, that comes about. Uh, let me skip ahead to verse number, uh, let's just read to verse number five so I don't miss anything. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All right, so they, he's raising the people up. They're going to go back and they're going to rebuild the temple in, in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver and gold and goods and with beasts, with precious things. Besides all, all that was willingly offered. Even King Cyrus, as you go ahead, said, remember all that stuff that Nebuchadnezzar took from you? You can even have it. All that gold, all those things that he had put he had put away in his house of gods, you can take it with you. So 
Cyrus is being very gracious to the people. He gives him 5,400 vessels of gold and silver. I don't know how big this vessel is, but even if it's like this, um, it's 5,000 of these full of gold and silver to take back, to help you get started, so you can, so you can give it to the Lord. And that remnant remained. That remnant was called. Isaiah speaks about the remnant. We know that there's always going to be a remnant. No matter what happens here, no matter that the United States has taken over and Christianity is banned, there's still going to be a remnant. There's still going to be a remnant around the world um, until the end of time. So they, they go off. All right. So the verse number, or chapter number one, relatively short, only 11 verses. We do see, we do see a name pop up. Uh, verse number eight, it mentions a guy by the name of Sheshbazar. Cool name to say. Um, they call him the Prince of Judah. We don't hear a lot about Sheshbazar. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about him as we go through. And there's some confusion about who he really is, who is Shesh Bazar. But we do know he was some sort of leader amongst the people, amongst the, the, the people of Judah. Uh, so they, take, they get all their people together. They got 42,000 of them. They take, they take all kinds of beasts and sort of things with them. And they go off on their journey. Uh, chapter number two, uh, this one's you know, it's very detailed. So if you want the roll call, basically who all went, chapter number two. And that's one way we see, too, where it's very similar to Chronicles. Chronicle has a lot of those lists of people and things that they did. This has all the people that were listed. So it says, we'll just read a couple of these verses. I'm not going to read every single name to you. But, and now are these, verse number one, and now these are the children of the province that went up out of captivity, of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one into his city. So he mentions the people. Uh, he mentions right off the bat Zerubbabel. That's a name we're going to focus on a lot over the first few chapters of, of Ezra. And this is one I was talking about as there's some confusion. And, you know, I, everything I could look at in, in my study Bibles and just looking at different things and kind of digging into it. Uh, there are some people who think that uh, Zerubbabel and Sheshbazar in chapter 1 are the same person. That maybe they had, this was just his Persian name at first. Um, that's, that's kind of a common belief. But then there are some who say, no, it's two different people. And it really... You know, for the purpose of what we're talking about, it doesn't really matter. What we do know is that they were either, they were one leader, they were the same person, or they were leaders at different times. Mm -hmm. But we're going to focus, we won't see that name Sheshbazar come back up. It'll be about Zerubbabel, which made me think, you know, I'm kind of glad they didn't name the book. Instead of Ezra, they named it Zerubbabel, because <laughs> the first six or seven chapters is all about him leading these people. So as you read through verses 2, all the way down to verse number 67, as you flip through, you'll see all these different lists of people. And we're talking about priests and Levites and, or, and you know, singers and all kinds. And it was very, and they did it on purpose for reasons of telling you exactly who was there and the types of people that were there. And as we get down to verse number uh, 60, uh, 67, uh, hold on, 66, 67, you see that there were horses, there were mules, there were donkeys, there were all kinds of people that they, all kinds of different things that they brought along. They're going about, I looked it up, it's about 900 miles, their, their journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. And it's kind of a, it's kind of like traveling in West Virginia. You don't get to hop on the freeway and go straight across. You know, it's kind of a roundabout journey to get there. I, I can only guess, uh, most people think it took them four or five months to get there, of their traveling. Which I figured that out, they're moving about seven miles a day. So it's a big group of 42,000 people. That's like taking... Uh, Monroe County, Summers County, and half of Greenbrier County, and all of us just walking to Boston, uh, along with a bunch of horses and donkeys and 5,000 plates of gold and silver. You know, that's just like, it's hard for me to imagine in the year 2023, whatever year we're in, uh, let alone in the year, you know, 580 something BC. So they had a mission, they had a goal, they knew where they wanted to be, they were led by God to get there, so obviously they're, you know, they're, they're going to have help and protection. But this is still this is still a very long journey. So after we get through the last thing that they do, so they finally arrive at the site. I kind of skipped ahead four months. But they get there, and what's the first thing they do? Verse number 68 in chapter 2, it says, Some of the chief of the fathers, so we're talking about like the leaders of the families, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, can you imagine what it looked like? I mean, this is the great temple, uh, the house of God that Solomon built, destroyed. Like I'm thinking in my head like, when we, nowadays, when we discover like these ancient cities that have been destroyed, it's literally like a few rocks on the ground. That was probably it. I mean, it had been several hundred years since this was destroyed, actually, you know, maybe close to a hundred years. So they get there, 
offered up freely. Hold on, let me go back to 68. When they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place, they gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work three score, one thousand grams of gold, five thousand pounds of silver, and one hundred uh, priest garments. So they did what they were supposed to. When they got there, they honored the Lord. They gave what they had. It says they gave after their ability. They gave what they had. It didn't say that they all gave the same amount. They gave exactly what they were able to give. So they get there. I'm sure it was a long journey. They were happy to be there. They were ecstatic. There's even a song that many think is about, is a little written about when they were returning. They were happy. They were singing. They were laughing. They were smiling. They'd been in captivity. Some of these people remember it. I'm sure there were younger people that don't. Some of these people remember the glory of this temple. And we're going to see what happens when they come back and see what's left. But, so they get there. They give their gifts. And they've arrived. Okay. So. Um, we're going to be in Ezra uh, chapter number 3 next week. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and uh, jot that down, we're going to be in lesson number 2. With, and so if, if you haven't had a chance to read through the whole uh, Ezra 1, 2, and 3, I would encourage you to do that and, and stay caught up. We're going to be pretty much on a chapter per week for the next several weeks. And then we'll get into the book of Esther uh, that kind of uh, is a companion to this. So. We're going to see next next week in, in verse or in chapter number three is once they get there now they they got to get started. It's like okay the honeymoon is over let's get to work and that's what we're going to see what happens here and they're going to of course run into some issues and run into some problems but you know the whole thing of this as I as I close this up is looking at thinking about the promises of God what the, the, what God has promised to us what God promised to to Israel what God promised to all the saints in the Bible. Those promises came true, and that's what happened here. Yes, they, they messed up. Yes, God allowed them to be taken away, but he gave them the opportunity to come back. He gave them that opportunity, that second, that third chance. So what I want you to think about um, for next week is the promises of God. And if you get a chance, and I'm not, I'm not going to you know, check you off or give you a zero or anything like that. I do that enough on my normal job. Uh, I want you to think up of two promises that God makes to a believer, and then two promises that God has made to an unbeliever. So, just if you have a chance, just flip through your Bible. If you want to use uh, the internet? Just be careful as you're digging through because there's some crazy stuff out there. But just look for two promises for the believer and two promises uh, for the unbeliever. Because it's, you know, if it comes true here, it's going to come true now. If it comes came true in 600 BC. You know, to a T, exactly how, it was, how uh, it was prophesied, it's going to come true now. So let's look at those, and it's something we can learn from, and we can, uh, and we can, we can grow our faith by it. But so, I feel like I was uh, flying through this, and, and anybody got any questions or comments or anything you want to add to it or take me down? Or... <laughs> so if you can remember, Shesh Bazaar and Zerubbabel. There's another couple names. I won't, there won't be a spelling test, but we will talk a lot about Zerubbabel. Now they say, well, what about Ezra? Where's he at? Well, you'll see Ezra. There's, uh, there'll be a second part to this that Ezra, Ezra's going to play a major part in this. And also don't be confused. Some of these names are names we've seen before, like Joshua and Nehemiah. Uh, these are not the same Joshua and Nehemiah that you're going to see later and before in the Bible. Obviously, it's not Joshua. He, um, he's been gone for a long time. There's a lot of names that are very similar to just people that were there. Uh, at the same time. So they, they play very major roles in the uh, restoring of the temple and to come, to come back to Jerusalem. So, anybody got anything to uh, add to it? Pastor Dan, would you mind to close us in prayer, please? Thank you. Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning we had, Lord, the Sunday school lesson, I think, for the Lord, uh, leading him, Lord, and speaking to him this morning. Lord, I uh, uh, look forward to, Lord, to our study of the book of Ezra and Esther, Lord, I pray that you will continue to be with our Sunday school class with our teachers, Lord, and God and direct them and mm-hmm. guide them through your word, Lord, and uh, learn more, grow closer to you. Lord, I pray that you use us to, uh, in our lives, Lord, to benefit, uh, Lord, your kingdom and what you have for our will, your will in our lives, Lord. I pray that you with us now, be with the uh, morning message, Lord, to be a passion and be Amen. Amen.